Okay, well I thought these were very interesting presentations and uh, across a wide spectrum and I think there's uh, a great opportunity for cross-disciplinary learning from the different approaches uh, and the surprising commonalities mm -hmm. across very diverse areas. Um, I'd like to pick up the issue of diabetes. I thought, thank you very much, it was an excellent presentation. Um, um, diabetes, actually, it, I, th I would challenge whether it's a prototype disease. I would say it's a legitimate disease. And it's legitimate because it fits the biomedic biomedical model perfectly. Here you have a biomedical dysfunction that's really legitimate. And it's proven and it might be complex and involve complex systems, which might ask you to question whether there's a, such a diagnosis as diabetes. Uh, we lump everything under one taxonomy. However, it sits comfortably because you have a legitimate medical issue. And then recognising the need for people to make change and to control their own health, it moves into the psychosocial and environmental. So I think it's very nice and we're very comfortable with it and I really appreciate what you've done and we can uh, learn from it. But I don't know that it's the archetype. I think it's a legitimate. Then, then we go to psychiatry <laughs> where we find um, a much less legitimate biomedical disorder, disease. Um, here's, here we have psychiatry looking for its biomedical base and being challenged because the problems are in the psychosocial and environmental area lacking the biomedical connection. And um, uh, speaking from outside psychiatry, um, as a general practitioner, we would like psychiatry to manage the psychosocial and environmental. And I think the focus on the biomedical is, 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 is very problematic. But um, we'll hear more other people's views on this. In terms of family-centred care, here we have a wonderful person or family-centred model that has face validity, it has legitimacy, it seems to make a lot of sense. But the operational, the operation of psychosocial um, centred management is more challenging than people think because we've got wonderful, in my PhD I did work on this, that what you've got is legitimate where you've got pathways for the legitimate biomedical management. But the operation of the psychosocial or person-centred is much more challenging. It seems easy to say, well, we'll just manage the psychosocial and we'll empower patients or we'll empower families. But it's actually a lot more difficult. And I think that's came out in the family-centred care model that it's actually quite challenging to operationalise what something would appear to be a good principle, but the practice is more difficult. And then we come to social care where we had a wonderful example of program evaluation. Oh, that biomedicine and health services research would adopt program evaluation rather than being completely hung up on Cochrane reviews to evaluate whether family-centred care works or not. And I think there was a lot of in very interesting learning on, on that model of um, uh, the implementation of individual care and, and set up in a, in a framework where there was a program evaluation. So I'd like to say excellent uh, comments, excellent presentations and my comments. Um, I'd like to echo Carmel's comments and the, the themes that came out f from me um, during the four presentations were um, the issue of how to tackle uh, abandonment um, and est estrangement. And what I really found interesting about um, the first presentation uh, on the complexity of managing diabetes and managing individuals you have with diabetes is that, um, for me at least, um, you managed to demonstrate the issue and the challenge um, the complexity of, of trying to um, uh, support individuals who have diabetes um, whenever they develop it. Um, and I also felt uh, very clear that you demonstrated the risk to the individual um, if, um, you know, if a smart approach is not implemented. Um, 
and certainly thinking about if I were diagnosed with the disease of diabetes, uh, the thought that there was a framework within which um, my uh, team could actually work within, that, that, that was visible to me as an individual patient, would to me make all the difference and would probably really support me to be able to um, do my part in actually managing my disease and support my physicians and nurses. And it would be predominantly clinical nurse specialists, I think, who would be supporting me, because that would be my choice. Um, with reference to the specialist diabetes team. So from my perspective, that, uh, if you like, that, um, that engagement with individual people through the SMART Girls spoke to me very well about how to actually manage what is a very complex uh, uh, situation. Um, I thought Linda um, described very well um, how um, particularly um, nurses, and I would challenge that all members of the children's team um, don't focus on the child, but I'll come back to that. Um, it is very easy when you're um, in the midst of um, a busy children's ward to start expecting parents to take the role of prime carer with probably minimal support. And to me, when parents are expected to do that, it is a form of abandonment because um, they get put in the position, as Linda described, of feeling that it's their duty um, to, to do everything um, and that um, I don't know what they sort, see the role of the nurse or, or other members of the team to be, but um, to my mind, um, th you know, clearly the, the, the shift has lost it. I think what I've seen demonstrated what I've seen demonstrated over the course of the last two days is the fact that we are still not working in a multidisciplinary way because to me, I know that there is a very good theoretical uh, knowledge which has been generated from inductive and deductive theory uh, for, from the body of uh, nursing theory that I know I've seen presented in a different way by some of the physicians here and I think we need to start looking uh, not only at working in practice together, but actually lifting that up and looking at the body of knowledge uh, and, and making clear some of those things. Um, I personally believe that I have never worked with a pediatrician who has not been child-centered. That actually it's when the pediatrician, the medical doctor, comes to see the patient who is the child, that actually you tend to see, in my experience, that, that the pediatrician talks to the child. Uh, you know, and. So I, I suppose, and I think that's the same in general practice, my lived experience of taking my kids to the doctor is actually, yeah, yeah, Dad, that's fine, you sit there, I just want to have to talk to, to Johnny. So I think maybe the, the abandonment that we see within the family-centered uh, model could be a nursing issue rather than, than the whole of the interdisciplinary team. I would have liked to have seen more clarification from Linda on that matter as to whether they dug down into that, into the research. When it came to um, when it came to the the, 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 the the Rogers presentation, the first thing I'm going to do when I go back uh, to Cambridge is I'm going to change or propose to the team we change the name of our rehab assistants because um, I really it struck me that the the cultural change and the philosophical change you made was that in health healthcare support workers well, became personal assistants to the client. So you've definitely put the client at the center. You know, it, it, you know, to me, that one word, that one name change, uh, introduced a, a, a concept of service, um, which actually puts the patient at the heart of what we were doing, or the service user at the heart of what you were doing. Um, so for me, we saw, and, and I think, what I saw demonstrated is the work that you've done is to um, become, t to no longer be estranged. <laughs> from the client group that you're working with, but actually to re-engage and renegotiate that relationship. So I thought the whole the themes that ran through, and I'm sorry I've taken so long, were excellent. For the four speakers, and one remotely, of course, but uh, it's really quite good uh, uh, care groups and indeed uh, disease focus uh, presentations. One thing, uh, Professor, is about the issues of diabetes. I mean, this is a huge conflict between guidelines and as you know government now very keen on guidelines actually professional bodies are very keen on guidelines they are becoming more like protocols than guidelines you know and uh, 
restricted in many ways a lot of uh, the freedom uh, which we need to uh, actually adopt in dealing with some patient depend on age and situation, etc. But what I see, I know your slide showing a little bit out of date guidelines, you know, some of the new guidelines in 2013 from American Diabetic Association and WHO study put higher level for uh, A1C, you know, and, and that, yeah, much higher. And actually, they give me much more flexibility with all their ages. I mean, uh, some of the uh, ADA talking about it doesn't matter if it's eight, you know, if, if it's suitable for the patient, you know. So I, I, I know your clinician, not necessarily in diabetes, not necessarily agree on something which is solid, you know. Uh, that's the fluidity of the subject itself, you know. But I, I see there are a lot of actually conflict between person center and indeed following guidelines. And I don't know how to bridge between the two. You know. And the uh, diabetic patients, especially now, uh, we are training them as expert patients. You know, uh, we, we, we're spending a huge amount of money in, in that sort of controlling the personal care themselves. You know. I know the title may not be nice, but this is how we call them in the UK, as you know, expert patients, you know. And they are really pushing the agenda a little bit more toward giving the power to the patients. I mean, our diabetic, as, as far as in my area, I recall, about 80% control and maybe even much higher than that, you know, from the studies uh, 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 actually published by Prof, Prof Majid, uh, uh, Azim Majid, on, on diabetes control, maybe more than 85% actually managed extremely well by GPs. So how can we balance between these two conflicts? I did not mention after 2012 guidelines because I think that the EASD, European Association of Study of Diabetes, and the ADA published those guidelines in 2012. Then 2013 and 2014, we are now seeing guidelines for different countries. So uh, we should go all over the world with the Spanish guidelines that differ from the Italian guidelines, just to give you an example, because the government imposes certain choices. So I think we are lost. We are lost because at that stage we are lost because we can talk <laughs> as much as we can, but we are lost because if you give metformin or sulfonylurea that costs three euros, or if you give the new GLP-1 analog that costs 70 euros, but in order to give those drugs, you need to have a, G a glycated hemoglobin between 7.5 and 8.5. That is becoming a nightmare. Honestly, it's a nightmare. And... <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows really what to do, but is actually driven by reimbursement. And this is where the drug companies are working very hard in order to uh, get the reimbursement feasible. So to, to answer that question is, uh, it is very difficult at the moment to decide where we stand. But our position is to keep the guidelines as a, an important parameter to keep in mind when we see our patient, but always try to remember the ABCD algorithm I mentioned to you. That is a very simple, cheap, and acceptable way to decide how to treat our patients.